hi in this video let's go through the next set of topics starting with the ground substance or the molecule in ground substance which influences fluid pressure or osmotic pressure in pulp so if you refer literature it's clearly given that glycosaminoglycons which are components of ground substance do influence osmotic pressure we'll review the literature now the consistency of a connective tissue is largely determined by proteoglycan components of ground substance. The long glycosaminoglycan chains of proteoglycan molecules form relatively rigid coils constituting a network that holds water, forming a characteristic gel. Ground substance also acts as a molecular sieve in that it excludes large proteins. Cell metabolites, nutrients and waste pass through ground substance between cells and blood vessels. In some ways, ground substance can be likened to a ion exchange resin because the polyanionic chains of glycosaminoglycons bind cations. In addition, osmotic pressures can be altered by excluding osmotically active molecules. Right? Now, so based on this literature, so it's somehow understood that glycosaminoglycons in the ground substance do influence the osmotic pressure right and let me know if at all there are initial additional keywords pertaining to this question along with options we'll review more literature and update the same in description if at all necessary right moving on to the next topic type 1 respiratory failure is seen or examples of type 1 respiratory failure i'm not sure but this is the keyword which i got so we have basically four types of respiratory failures type 1 or hypoxemic type 2 hypercapnic type 3 perioperative respiratory failure type 4 respiratory failure a shock right a shock kind of entity so if you look into the examples of type 1 so type 1 respiratory failure again we have cardiogenic pulmonary edema and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema so in non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema we have acute lung injury as well as acute respiratory distress syndrome ARDS now moving on to the next topic lipopolysaccharide is inactivated by or digested by or whatever see we have a molecule called lactoferrin which is present in several secretions this inter interacts with lipopolysaccharide thereby inactivating the same so we'll review some literature pertaining to it lactoferrin is an iron binding protein present in large quantities in colostrum and in breast milk in external secretions as well as in pmns Lactoferrin's protection against microbial infection was the first activity discovered and it is currently the most widely studied function to date. So the mechanisms or the antimicrobial activity of lactoferrin is due to two different mechanisms. Its primary role is to sequester free iron, thus removing an essential substrate required for bacterial growth and exerting a bacteriostatic effect. The other mechanism involves a direct interaction of lactoferrin in, with infectious agent. Lactoferrin binds to lipopolysaccharide of bacterial walls and may also damage bacteria via formation of peroxides catalyzed by lactoferrin bound iron ions. So it's clearly mentioned that this lactoferrin has a potential to bind and interact with the lipopolysaccharide component of bacterial cell wall, right? So lactoferrin binds to lipopolysaccharide of bacterial walls and may also damage bacteria via formation of peroxide. So different mechanisms through which lactoferrins exert their antimicrobial effect, right? Now moving on to the next topic, a rule of tens, pheochromocytoma. So we have uh, this several 10 persons in terms of uh, the malignant potential in terms of percentage incidence or whatever we'll just review those 10 persons now few chromocytomas are often referred to as 10 percent tumor because they do many things about 10 percent of the time so few chromocytomas 10 percent are malignant which means the rest 90 percent are benign they are 10 percent bilateral 10 percent extra renal 10% occurring in children, 10% familial, 10% tend to recur, 10% are associated with MEN syndrome, men syndrome, and 10% present with a stroke, right? Hence, it is called as 10% tumor, rule of tens for pheochromocytoma. 
Now moving on to the next topic, hemoglobin or heme is present in which of the following molecules? So heme is present not just in hemoglobin but also in myoglobin. We'll review some literature now. Hemoglobin is a conjugated protein consisting of an iron containing pigment. The protein part is globin and the iron containing pigment is heme. Heme also forms a part of structure of myoglobin which is an oxygen binding pigment in muscles and neuroglobin oxygen binding pigment in brain. Right? Now, moving on to the next topic. Rotational changes in mandible consist of 25% matrix rotation or 50% intramatrix rotation. So you have these combinations, right? So in profit, it's clearly given that it's 25% matrix rotation and 75% intramatrix rotation. We'll just review some literature pertaining to the same. Zork and Skiller distinguished two contributions to internal rotation of the mandible, right? Which is called as total rotation. So these include matrix rotation or rotation around the condyle intramatrix rotation or rotation which is centered within the body of the mandible so it's clearly given that one of the features of internal rotation of mandible is the variation between individuals ranging up to 10 to 15 degrees and for an average individual with a normal vertical phase proportions or vertical facial proportions there is about a minus 15 degree internal rotation from age 4 to adult life of which 25% results from matrix rotation and 75% results from intramatrix rotation right now moving on to the next topic what should be used to prevent ischemic heart disease so you gave me several options like nitroglycerin isosorbide mononitride sublingual road whatever so in one of the articles it's clearly mentioned that sublingual nitroglycerin should be considered as first line therapy for treatment of angina in patients with suspected unstable angina or ischemic heart disease who are either being observed for ruling out myocardial infarction management protocols have been discharged from a hospital emergency department or have been hospitalized with angina pectoris with or without acute myocardial infarction so it's clearly given that sublingual nitroglycerin should be considered as a first line therapy for treatment of angina in patients with either suspected unstable angina or ischemic heart disease and in uh, tripathi also it's clearly given that sublingual route is used when terminating an attack of angina or aborting an imminent one which is or which might probably happen right that's pertaining to nitroglycerin sublingual route right now moving on to the next topic flux so what does it remove so in one of the uh, literature uh, reviews it's clearly mentioned that flux is something uh, for that matter we'll start from Phillips in, Fl uh, in Phillips it's clearly mentioned that flux is something which is employed to increase fluidity of alloy and a film of flux formed on the surface of molten alloy helps prevent oxidation so that's the purpose of a flux and flux is applied and stainless steel is heated chromium oxide is removed from the surface by molten flux and after brazing a thin layer of chromium free iron may be left exposed at the surface of a stainless steel so in brief the function of flux and the objective of using a flux in our dentistry or in uh, specific dental materials right now moving on to the penultimate topic in which of the following occlusion is relieved so in which of the following conditions is occlusion relieved? I think you have different combinations of vital teeth with normal surroundings or whatever. So first of all, why do you need to reduce occlusion? Because whenever there is any uh, mastication happening or any force acting on a tooth, nociceptors which are present in the periapical area might get activated which can aggravate pain. So in order to reduce, minimize or eliminate the stimulation of nociceptors, we're trying to reduce the tooth at the occlusal level isn't it so in one of the studies it's clearly mentioned that occlusal reduction helps in prevention of post instrumentation pain in teeth with irreversible pulpitis sensitivity to percussion pretreatment pain and absence of periradicular radiolucency so these criteria are clearly clearly given in one of the studies here so in one of the studies it's mentioned that occlusal reduction helps in prevention of post instrumentation pain in teeth with irreversible pulpitis sensitivity to percussion pretreatment pain in other words symptomatic tooth and absence of periradicular radiolucency right so this is some uh, literature review pertaining to whether you have to reduce uh, the occlusion or not depending upon the status of pulp depending upon the status of the periapical area and also depending upon the clinical features right 
Now, moving on to the final topic. I think there was a question on different kinds of needs or as such need. A survey was done to find out the number of carriers teeth in a population. I'm not sure if this is the exact question, but I'm sure you had a question on needs. So what is need and what are different types of needs? We'll just re review some literature pertaining to public health dentistry. So the concept of need and social justice. Need is an important concept in public health. It's used in planning and management of health services, including health improvement, resource allocation and equity. However, need is multifaceted concept with no one universal definition. So Bradshaw has given four types of social needs, normative need, felt need, expressed need, comparative need. So I'll present you with the table so that it will be easy for you to follow while I'm going through literature. Normative need, need that is defined by experts. Normative needs are not absolute and there may be different standards laid down by different experts. Example, vaccinations like a decision by a surgeon that a patient needs an operation right so it can be either vaccination is something which an expert goes and decides surgery is something which an expert goes and decides isn't it so something of that sort felt need need perceived by an individual felt needs are limited by individual perceptions and knowledge of services example having symptoms having headache having pain tooth pain carrier's tooth etc now, expressed need, it's nothing but a demanded need. Felt need turned into action is nothing but expressed need. Example, going to dentist for a, tooth, a toothache, which often doesn't happen in our scenario, isn't it? Now, comparative need, needs identified by comparing the services received by one group of individuals with those received by another comparable group. A rural village, example, a rural village may be identified or may identify a specific need for a well or a school if the neighboring village has one. So it's all about comparison, right? Hence, it's called as comparative need. If you have something, I feel I should have something. If you're getting benefited, I feel uh, I should get benefited from the same, isn't it? So comparative need. So these are four types of needs given by Bradshaw. And need as such is considered as an important concept in public health because it helps in planning and management of health services, right? So these are some topics which I wanted to highlight in this specific video. And if at all there are any additional topics, with uh, options possible, do let me know. We'll see if we can discuss uh, the rem remaining 15 or 20 questions or whatever. I hope it's clear. Wish you all the best. Love you all.